Well, welcome everybody to Learn at Lunchtime. As uh, always, you're still always trying to figure out all the little technical difficulties of Zoom, but um, I think everybody's seeing me now and all we're all good. Um, I'm Sherry Trimble, museum educator at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. And although kind of a little odd today, we are <laughs> technical difficulties, but uh, we're still gonna have a great session today. It is being recorded. Uh, so I wanted to let everybody know about that. Um, at the end, sometime midweek, especially with the holiday, we'll be sending out the uh, copy of the recording. So we should be good. Um, we are gonna do question and answer at the end of the program. There's an option at the bottom of your screen uh, that you can use that. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat box some information um, on etiquette, um, some interesting links. And one of the interesting links I wanted to tell you about is that we are planning on reopening the State Museum on April 30th. Um, so if you're interested in learning about how that's going to work, because there are going to be some limited hours and times like that, that's the best source for all the most current information. And I will put that in the chat box links. And we'll share that again at the end. So, um, Amy, we're going to be bringing you in now. Uh, Amy is our fine arts curator at the State Museum, and I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you, Sherry, for that introduction. Hello, and welcome to our Artist Conversation series, where we focus on artists and work from the fine art collection. Today, I am honored to be speaking with Tina Williams Brewer about Yo Bloodline, a story quilt that was accessioned in 1997 as part of the Art of the State Purchase Award Program. And uh, Tina Williams Brewer is an internationally renowned fiber artist, educator, and community leader based in Pittsburgh. She has been a leading force with a Pittsburgh-based residency program of the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts, as well as the Art and Kids Museum Project with the Society for Contemporary Craft. Her story quilts have been highlighted in the American Arts and Embassy program for more than 20 years and featured in more than 50 exhibitions across the United States. The Pittsburgh Filmmakers, Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, named her a Lifetime Achievement Artist in 2009 and a Master Visual Artist in 2013. In 2018, she was named Artist of the Year by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Governor's Award for the Arts. And welcome, Tina. Well, thank you so very much, Amy. I'm pleased to be here uh, and really excited to share this piece because uh, it was one of the original four pieces that I did on the um, my self-discovery, my journey of learning about the African and African-American experience. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I wanna thank you for having me. Thank you so much. It is an honor. And uh, this is on the screen right now. Can everyone see the screen? Let's see. Okay. I see Yo Bloodline. Is that visible? Yep, you are good. Okay. This is Yo Bloodlines. Okay. Perfect. It's um, from the collection. Go ahead. And uh, would you like to begin with, with Harvest? We have some images of that as well. Okay. So Harvest is the first piece that I created in the series of the four quilts. Um, I, uh, uh, the Harvest is the only one that I still have in my possession. The others in, are in uh, private collections and in museums. Um, the Harvest was the hardest piece to do because it was difficult to get people on board to, to really look at um, survival of the Middle Passage as a point of departure and of celebration. Um, and I think that they all came from my experience with some of my Jewish friends who held up their Holocaust in such high regard and never to forget. And I felt that that was an important thing for, for African Americans also to understand what they have to be proud of and the survival of this horrific um, middle passage needs more dialogue. And so um, the quilt is a wonderful platform for uh, tough topics. And um, so the piece was created um, to first in a traditional way. So I am no longer a traditional quilter. I am a quilt artist mm -hmm. and I use materials in a very different way, but because this was in the uh, very beginning of my work, I used traditional patterns to tell the story. It was done in the uh, African tradition of strip 
strip quilting, which is the way that the kente cloth is woven and then a whole cloth is put together. So I usually work in a grid and the patterns on the side of this piece is our is the Underground Railroad or Jacob's Ladder. And at the very bottom are the harvest, the harvest um, at the very bottom, the, the harvest staffs to show the royalty that was celebrated at the harvest in Africa. Of course, we know that this is the harvesting of human beings, of human cargo. And so it takes a very dark turn there. But in the center, you see a pattern called the slave chain which I created to celebrate my father-in-law, John Brewer, who was uh, a, a champion for the regular everyday person. And he loved children and he believed in education. And he was the first African-American principal in Western Pennsylvania, the first to go to the uh, Board of Education. So upon his transition, I took his, his ties and I incorporated it into lifting the story of the survival of the African-American as we are still trying to survive and to be educated and to take our place uh, on the platform of the world because we've made many, many contributions. So the birds at the top are three-dimensional, uh, which was a hallmark of my original quilts. I always had um, three-dimensional pieces. And the reason for that was I, was, I have a flare, very flat vision and sometimes it's difficult for me to um, get the perspectives that I need. So that's why I work in layers. So I start with the grid and add the pieces and then I embellish it with light. And the embellishment when the light source comes from um, my grandmother who was like the sparkle queen and she was so <laughs> wonderful and she lived in, in um, Kentucky and um, she was a very spiritual person but she gave everything to her family, but she always had like beautiful jewelry and hats and gloves and so forth and so on. And they all came from the secondhand store. So I think that's where I got my need to make scrap quilts versus quilting quilts that are made from new fabric. So most of these, most of this fabric in here came as gifts from other people. And because I was an interior decorated, there's upholstery fabric, which you're not supposed to use in a quilt, upholstery fabric on the background. So it has, they were never ever intended to be anything other than uh, wall art. So can you ask me a couple of questions? That's, that's really powerful. I love the way that you were able to uh, literally weave your heritage into the story quilts as well. And, uh, and I think it's really powerful also to include um, the ties of uh, John Brewer the first in the in the the central pattern, and um, also the 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 grid is broken by the by the alignment of the staffs and with the harvest birds at the top. And then people often ask about the figure at the top that's kind of hovering over the whole thing. And that is just to, to kind of balance it out that, you know, there's there's the good and the evil. And I work with the yin and the yang all the time. So I never want to ever dismiss the fact that there is there's blessings in this world, but also there are, you know, dark clouds that are there as well. So I like to acknowledge them. Um, Why don't I, uh, sh I can share some details. I have a, here. Let's see if I can sit. There we go. This uh, shows a detail of the uh, birds at the top and the figure that you were just referring to. Right there at the and top. That yes, right here. And uh, where are there? Is there other? Uh, are there other symbols in the quilt, or uh, where does uh, some of the other imagery come from? Well, the, so the the imagery came from um, a um, American Vision. Uh, cattle, not uh, magazine that my friend Jan Myers brought to me. She and her husband had received it, and um, I was overwhelmed when I saw the image. It it was the image at the bottom of a slave ship, and mm -hmm. I've never, you know, I had never seen that before. And right away, I felt like hmm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a mature person, and why haven't I ever been exposed to this? So I was really driven to express myself 
myself and to share this information because if I didn't know it, I wondered how many other people didn't have any familiarity with with the, with this image. And so I started using these figures. Uh, well, so this I made it in '88, and um, I made it for a show with the women of visions uh, that they had in Homewood, which was um, a Harambe festival. So I made it in '88, but then. I use those figures. They are throughout all of my work. Some of the my work maybe might be missing, but most mostly all of my work has those figures that reference the survival of the Middle Passage. So they, I kind of call them my logo. I did, a, I had a show in, um, I think in '94. It was one person show in in uh, Dallas, not in Dallas, in. Um, San Antonio, and they pulled it out and, and they used it as a logo. They said, you have a logo. And I said, okay, so for now I have a lo logo. But um, <laughs> this one is this one is very straightforward. I mean, I was just really clear about what it was I was trying to express. And in the expression is that we were spiritual people, that we were surviving people, and that we had been harvested from the motherland. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, then the sequins are on the top. Uh, it's beginning to, you know, to be to fade a little bit, but they're sequins. And then the harvest birds are very decorative, uh, because in you know, uh, and I I speak of Africa in general as a continent, but of, of course every country within the continent has their own culture, uh, and so I don't mean to like just blanket it. But the harvest, we know that the harvest. Is the, is the celebration of planting of the seas and, and the continuum of, of the energy and the bloodline. So that was, that was my take on that. Excellent. Let's, uh, this is a detail of the bottom. And uh, okay. since you mentioned bloodline, oh, I'm sorry, did you wanna? Well, we can, you know, because that, you know, this, start, this was the beginning this was actually the beginning. And then mm -hmm. that, then I started working towards the next step. So um, I think that there was a, another quote in between, which would have been, um, I should have done my, uh, my chronological order, which was Odegori, <laughs> which also talked about, you know, uh, and I had never been to Ghana, so I didn't know, but I had a friend, Crystal Turner, who had visited and had, 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 you know, stories to tell. So this is where the oral history comes into play. When somebody tells you a story that you can manifest it in a visual interpretation so they can be shared out. And um, one of the things that uh, she told me about was the, the uh, door of no return and um, in how that castle felt and, and the suffering that was there. And of course, you know, I had several people, more than one, that really wasn't interested in these really heavy topics. But I hoped, hopefully what I did try to do is to give them like a, a, a glow and a beauty to bring people into it without having to feel that they, they were intruding because mm -hmm. they're made, at, all of these pieces were made as teaching tools and mm -hmm. they were part of my uh, trunk show that I took from school to school talking to the children about these heavy topics and having them observe and look at it and pull out the symbolism and hear what they have to say about it. So through from one quilt to the other, it's based on questions and interests from the children. And I was working mostly with middle schoolers at the time. I do more elementary uh, as time went on, but the middle school students were very, very interested in um, learning about outside of what we know as African, African American culture here, but what, where did we come from? And you know, do we have to really always have to deal with slavery? Well, we, we have to deal with it and then we have to keep going. You know? mm -hmm. and, and that was really, I think the progression of the work was doing the hard work up front. My mom always says, tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And then my father always said, um, you are as good and everybody is equal, that every soul is important and that we need to lift them up. And so, and then, you know, let God, 
lead the way on all the other parts of it. So telling the truth and making everybody equal in terms of what you need to lift them up is, is part of the roots that I brought fr from Huntington, West Virginia to, to Pittsburgh. Uh, and there, Pittsburgh has its own energy um, mm -hmm. that helped to propel the, the I, you know, I, I guess I wanna say the um, hunting and the excavation of the information uh, that I wasn't familiar with. I am not an academic, I'm a visual artist and I'm an advertising major and, and I was not even a sem seamstress. So all of this that you see came out of just trying to do the work the best that you can. It may not be perfect, mm -hmm. but it was the best that I could to be able to tell the story and to keep the information alive because we need to talk about the hard issues and we need to uplift people. And um, by just ignoring it, doesn't do the job. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That seems like a, a great way to segue into your bloodline. And here is an image of the entire quilt. And I'm going to move forward to a detail of the bottom. Okay. And uh, would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about the, the narrative and the symbolism? Okay. Well, the most important part about the progression of this is that the um, original concept and idea of the quilt of the harvest came from a lithograph. This came from a, a grouping of symbols and experiences that I had um, doing um, classes at the Homewood Library, ancient African history classes and trying to capture some of the, the regalia and, and the beauty of the, the culture and the celebration. Uh, and not so much about, not it so much about the, um, the, the struggles, but more about the uplift. So these are the women, and you know, I, I, I love the women that, that are taken from what I used, when I go to the ballet, I used to go to see Alvin Ailey and I would make sketches and designs. And then also my father-in-law was a carver. So he had a lot of uh, images of carvings. So I would take the, the drawings that I would do at the ballet and the carvings that he had. Uh, and he was a good friend with Kaylee Ir Irvis. So I think that he okay. and Kaylee Ir Irvis worked together on, on their uh, carvings. So, but I didn't know that until way late. But anyway, so the women are holding up a traditional pattern, which is called the tree of life. That's which, and, and so in the tree of life, I didn't do it in traditional, you know, patterns. I used um, batik patterns and African patterns so that it would be, you know, absolutely a, a comment about African roots and about mm -hmm. the tree of life. So then um, at the far left, there is a, there's, looks like a little horseshoe uh, and it is an animal you know, and it is a, and it's a dung beetle. And so with the dung beetle, that means there's a whole story that goes along with the dung beetle where, you know, it, it, it hatches out of whatever the mess is. And then this most beautiful bug appears. And the story is about uh, rebirth, basically. Mm -hmm. So the rebirth and the uh, Sankofa bird, which is, way down the line, I bet. Uh, they are they about looking back, learning from your mistakes and then moving forward. So there are little captions of symbolism throughout the bottom portion of the quilt, which really represents more of the life uh, and the culture uh, in the motherland. And so the figure on the far right is a celebratory figure whenever the men went off to, to war. Uh, I thought that that because, well, let's go to the part where, why did I make the quilt? Okay, so we have to kind of back up a little bit. Why did I make the quilt? I made the quilt in response to um, the street wars that were going on in our community. 
And um, I just felt like, you know, I, there was so, in some way or another, we needed to acknowledge what was happening in the community and that the children were trying to survive it. So talking about it, showing them the warriors. So there is, you know, war, wars have always been, okay? And so in Africa, uh, we had wars as well, but first we were in, we were always one with nature. So you have this warrior figure who is surrounded by, you know, the lizard and the lion, which are for courage and transformation. And then the figure on the side is a uh, Islamic ring, the purple is an Islamic ring. Uh, so there, it represents the presence of more than one spirituality that came out of, out of, out of Africa. And Africa has many, many religions. And because I'm Catholic, um, I'm interested in other people's religions as well. So, and I never want to dismiss anybody's beliefs. So I try to always place some uh, acknowledgement of other people's religions as well in my work. So, um, the, so this is that it goes to the right, then it goes up and you see from the body paint on this piece and that is not traditional uh, fabric. It's just kind of like a, like an organza, you know, and it was difficult to get the work, you know, to paint it, but I painted it and then it's all appliques. So this is all, again, a very tight piece. There is Jacob's Ladder, again, on the far right side, mm -hmm. which is a kind of an aesthetic building of uh, and transitioning from the motherland into uh, and, the, and acknowledging the wars that were there to the Americas, which would we, we were in part with every war. We've been, our men have been very, very brave, have been involved in the wars and they are always on the front line. So let's talk about that, you know, because black men have had, um, haven't had the opportunities to really to push out and just like a regular conversation, all, all of their courage and taking care of their families through mm -hmm. slavery, and all the other things. So we don't need to go too deep into that, but but the shields are taken from um, carvings that I that I located in some of my resource material. And then again, you have the figures on the far right laying on their side, to, again, talking and reminding us of the Middle Passage and the bravery that, um, that our, our, our people you know, had to endure to be able to make it to them. So the only, the very best made it, the strongest. And so, you know, that, and we need to say that over and over again. And then there is a line of white sequence that goes throughout the piece that helps you, that's an aesthetic choice that helps you to um, move throughout the quilt and then end up at the very top with the Yo Boys which are our youth of the 90s who were struggling so hard to be able to find safety on in their homes, in their streets, uh, in their schools. And um, so, you know, the, I thought that the, pa the patterns, the patterns that are in there is again, the Jacob's Ladder to, to talk about the spirituality too. And at the very top of the quote, um, the pattern that is there is called hovering hawks. And uh, that's again, a traditional pattern. So when I started to do, do this work, um, I was on, on foreign territory. I was working with traditional quilters and I felt like I needed to prove my ability to be able to do piece work, okay? And that's the hovering hawks and the uh, Jacob's Ladder. Plus it also, fell into the grid, which we were, I was talking about in the very first piece that there is a grid before there are these, you know, moving figures. And you'll see the moving figures throughout all of my work pretty much gives you an, uh, a feeling of flying over and being an observer looking down on. It. And so the, the, I guess the work really has like a performance 
mm-hmm. quality to it. And, and I think that performance and um, staging, because I was an interior decorator, so I kind of uh, approached it in, you know, a performance. So whether or not the music is there to, for the viewer, you can actually feel the music. And I actually did, I did do a piece called See the Music. So, mm-hmm. um, so music has been like a really important part of the creation of the work and how it is applied to the grit. Mm-hmm. Is that, does that make sense? It does, it does. And I noticed that uh, some of the, the symbols uh, are, uh, the, the figures do resemble the ones used in Harvest, but they have their, their arm raised. What's the significance of the, the raised arm? Well now, but you know what, but wait, that's why it's important, I think, to go back and revisit work. Mm-hmm. I mean, back then it was, we raise your hands to to praise the ancestors. That was a a traditional thing. You raise your hand to the ancestors. But now after last year, we have to go back and look at it again and say, what does that really mean? Because the raising of hands is a suggestion that, um, you know, that we, we are taking a firm stand, you know, taking a firm stand never again. Mm -hmm. And so like the young guys at Mm -hmm. the top, they're raising their hands also, but they have on their little baseball caps. And so they're the modern day warriors. So that is mm-hmm. their symbolism. Mm-hmm. But it's all connected mm-hmm. I mean, with, the, with the bloodline, which is the white sequence that take you throughout the entire piece. And then the fabric. We show... hmm? What did you say? So, sorry, um, I was gonna go, uh, let me go forward a little bit. So um, I wanted to show you were, you were mentioning the, the sequins and I just wanted to take back to the, the overall view so you can see how they kind of lead up through the chronology to the top. Right, and then you'll see the fabric at the, uh, most of the fabric t- at towards the bottom in the middle is all African fabric, but as you get to the top, it has more traditional calicos and um, just, you know, uh, recycled fabric from old clothes or whatever. So there was an intention uh, in changing the fabric uh, from African fabric to a more American Kana. So. I'm always amazed at the amount of meaning and symbolism that's in your bloodline. It seems like there's always uh, more in it than uh, than I previously remembered. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for uh, teaching us. Did you did you pick up that there is another another guiding force uh, on this piece that will take you throughout and guide you through, and that would be the birds that started the, the birds bottom, the birds that start at the bottom, and work mm-hmm. the way up and there throughout. And so I have birds uh, in many of my my pieces as well because the, the, the tradition, the folklore is that the birds are the messengers and they're the messengers from the ancestors. So there's representation there for, for the birds, uh, birds and fish, they, they both have. I, got, I had a book that, that a librarian gave to me many years ago called Africanisms in America. And that was one of the things that I pulled from that book, which was, um, you know, that because of the way um, the slave trade happened and people were like, like gathered, taken, gathered, you know, held and then put on a boat and absolutely had no idea where they were going, that they just knew it was by water. And so it was water and sky uh, and that you could put little mess, scar- carve little messages, which goes into the point about all of the symbols that I used later on in my work. Uh, but the, the, uh, symbols were identified and they came by memory, you know, mostly what came from Africa with the Africans and enslaved Africans was, was their library. Their library is in their head because everything was oral history. And so they brought much more than what is being given credit for as they helped to build this country, but they still wanted to connect with their their family members, and they felt if they could just carve a little symbol in the beak of the bird or the fish and the gills, 
and send it back through the water or through the sky that, to let them know that they were okay. And I, I also included uh, one of your uh, recent story quilts. And uh, some of the, the symbolism looks like it carries through into this one. Looks like this one was created in 2020. Yes, well, this was, this was part, this actually, I started this piece before the pandemic, um, the Christmas before the pandemic. And uh, again, I was, I told, I'm telling the same story, but in a, just in different imagery. Um, so we can look at the, the, the enslaved Africans at the bottom of the boat that are on the far right. Again, they have the hand, um, raised hand, which is, you know, reaching. Um, and then in the heart is the cowrie shell, uh, which is the bloodline and, and um, also the representation of money. The cowrie shell represented money a lot. Of, and so when we think about what this, this was all about, it really is about greed. Uh, so when I include the cowrie shell in the work, it really makes reference to money changers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the women figures that are at, at the, the women figures that's at the very bottom is a celebratory figure. And um, again, one of those sketches that I did when I went into, went to the ballet and and so those figures also are throughout a lot of my work as well. But the thrust of this piece is, is, is about the energy and the celebration. And it says, look what we brought, look what we energy from to the West, what we brought so that you have on the far left side, you have the blue ocean waters, you have at the very top, a very celestial cosmic feeling fabric. Um, and these are again sabori fabric at the mm -hmm. bottom, but you know, like a like a, a rayon fabric at the very top. So I used fabric to denote texture, storyline, uh, and I don't really. So I have a huge collection. I don't just use one type of fabric. Most of the um, the orange fabrics were purchased, um, you know, in uh, a store in Atlanta over the holiday. And um, so orange seems to vibrate for me. And then the white overlays are what you see at the, at initially that will calipote you and see the direction. So all the direction is going to the left. And, um, now I, and of course I love the mud cloth and the mud cloth is mm -hmm. an interesting fabric because it in itself is, is its own language. And I can't tell you what that says because I don't have my, my, all of my notes, but I use a, mm -hmm. a, a grouping of symbols. Um, I use, um, and Dinkra symbols, which come from Ghana, but then I have a corpus of symbols that I received uh, in another book that I got at the Smithsonian that has like the continent. It has many countries that are represented and they're very lyrical. So uh, I will use the, the symbols, the lyrical symbols on the very top to kind of and you know, kind of like push you along so that you understand the direction and help you to kind of move through the piece. This one is very dense. Uh, and I think that the thing that, that you know, helps you to move through it is the, the dots of red and orange that take you, you know, you look for the mm -hmm. line, it, it takes you up. But then once you get to the top of the quote, it pushes you, you know, to the left and on um, the trees, I've been taking pictures of trees for years, trees and roots, because um, it's about planting seeds and legacy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, we have to, you know, make that important when 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 people are young, so that they understand that the, each person, each soul that comes, has a legacy before they leave. And what do you want your legacy to be? So, mm -hmm. um, in the I guess in the center of the quilt. Uh, you can see uh, go up, 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 up a little higher. And then to the left, you see the diet. Yes, you went past the, the diet, come back to the right, that white. Yes, you see the diaspora series there. And um, I did, I, you know, in uh, 2011, I had a um, uh, 
opportunity to be at the Artist Imagery uh, Resource Center on the north side of Pittsburgh. And uh, the staff there helped me to create a series of medallions. And, and you know, this is one of them. Uh, this is the main one, but there were three overlays. And so I had, they printed all of the, of the uh, design on there. But the important thing about that, this is that it shows the, the Atlantic, it shows the slave trade uh, that I got out of an encyclopedia that shows that much of the slave trade went north and it went east before it would, and, and then into South America. And only one arrow actually was pointing towards the United States. And that was kind of a game stopper for me because it's like when we are introduced to slavery, we think it's just all about us, but slavery was entrenched and it was a system. And um, so what I, I use that image along with a, an, an overlapping image of the Nile River to talk about how um, people migrated, you know, the migration mm -hmm. of people and cultures and how it migrated from the seat of, of Africa in the, in the Sudan and went north into the Mediterranean. And that through that bubble that is the Mediterranean, the cultures moved around that water because water is such an important part of, of migration. And so, I mean, that's, that's a whole nother story altogether, but um, that's kind of how my mind kind of wandered along and, <laughs> and um, sometimes it's hard to keep up with. So you can stop me. Well, well we do is... have several questions actually. Um, right now we've got about six in. So this is probably, you kind of let us right into that. Okay. Um, a time for question and answer. Um, so Amy is gonna be using that question and answer box. Um, so if you have any other questions that you want to look at, um, add those to the box. Okay. okay, are you ready? Ready, let's see what we can do. Our Don't first let me question... get along with it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, a, there's an entire lifetime and a career to share. So there's a, <laughs> so much important information there. And our first question is, uh, why is upholstery fabric a no-no for quilt making? Well, when I started quilting, I actually, um, the group that I was working with, and I love them all dearly because they all shared, um, the, the poster fabric is really heavy and it's really hard to do applique and to turn and it ravels. And um, so I, I learned to quilt by, by fire because uh, my very first quilt that I did was out of um, uh, velvet and moire, which is like, oh, awful. And it was mm -hmm. before there was um, wonder under and things to, to attach it to. And I didn't know that I needed to, you know, have a bond. And um, so it, it you so working with upholstery fabric at the base, it's okay now, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a no-no in, in those days. But because again, salvature, I was an interior decorator. I had bags and bags and bags of things. And then people would give me their samples if I went to, to a postery shop. So, you know, I used what I could get um, to be able to create. I think artists need to create no matter what. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have two questions from Kindle. Uh, the first one is, why was it important uh, to you to put an artistic spin on traditional African-American quilting? And uh, how long did this method take you? Well, you know, I wasn't, first of all, I was not the first, okay? Um, I had a wonderful uh, experience with Joyce Scott's mother, I would say is, was the very first uh, woman who got out and really used that tradition of scrap quilting. And she, and, uh, and sourcing whatever materials that she got. And I think she might've even used some uh, upholstery fabric. Um, let's see. Uh, what was it? Uh, the, let's see, Harriet, Harriet Powell. Harriet Powell was the other quilter that was, she used all cotton, but she used those figures uh, of embroidery. So 
I had, you know, I had some great people to look at, but the thing about it is to, to look at great people and then put your own spin on it so that it becomes your technique. But um, I, I, did I answer that question enough? But I mean, I can go a little deeper if we need to. Well, we have, a, we have a second question here from Kendall that I'll add on to that. Uh, how do you determine what black themes, textiles, materials you will create in your artwork? And are there other uh, artists that you pull your, in for your inspiration from? Um, well, let's see. I use whatever fabric is available, okay? And, um, and again, I, I do use use fabric because my family came from uh, midwifery and they collected scraps. And my very first quilt that I quilted was a scrap quilt from, from that sourcing. So I feel like uh, fabric has its own energy. People leave their touch on fabric. So it, that goes into a whole new energy kind of thought process. So I do buy new fabric now, but I always try to make sure that I'm using some of the scrapping because it, that brings a new energy, the, the old energy to the new fabric. Uh, what was the other part of the question? What artists, uh, what other black artists inspire you? Okay, well, you know, um, I will say that, uh, are we talking about fiber artists? I started, I started out with um, Bing Davis out of Wilberforce, Ohio in 92. And I was included in a group show. And if you haven't ever, it's an, you can get it off of Amazon now. It's a very old show. It says Uncommon Beauty and Common Objects, where he brought in such an enormous group of artists. Michael Cummings was one of the artists that I met there. Sandy German was one of the other artists that was there. Um, uh, are we done? I would, one way. Oh, uh, oh. Keep, keep going. Okay. Uh, you can keep talking, yeah. Okay, and Carolyn Maslumi. So we were all kind of like newbies doing our thing. We're, we're all original artists and in, in doing different art forms, but this was about craft art. And so it was the very first, uh, I guess, uh, academic study on African-Americans presence in the craft arts of America. And so he just, he just piled us all in there together. And that's where I, I began to meet so many wonderful people that I've been able to maintain good relationships with. So, um, that's a lot. I mean, Joy Scott, though, I will say, if you look at my work now, you will see this very robust figure that's there. She looms over and blesses all. And um, when she was here in Pittsburgh at uh, one time, I took a, a grouping of pictures from her and I made designs of her very animated. Uh, and she's a great study. And I just do her over and over again because she's just so, so, so colorful and so wonderful. And she's been very... Um, she's been very helpful and very giving, very giving personality. And I didn't know her mom, but, um, but if she's anything like her daughter, perfect. Mwah. <laughs> and I, I had a, a request here to, to show your bloodline again. So I'm going to try yeah. to, uh, go back and share the screen let me see if i can while she's doing that um one question that's a simple one are the figures applicate on yes okay so in the very beginning remember i uh i said i did all piece work traditional work and they were all applicate on and they were they were needle turned and inside of each figure was a pick brown paper bag so i did it traditionally i became very involved with my husband in our business here in the community and so I created this body of work that is kind of more like 95 pieces now over a period of time where I was very involved, not in quilting, but in teaching, uh, being an entrepreneur and raising my family. So sometimes I, I I'm, that's why I said, sometimes I figure that it had to be the divine, otherwise the work wouldn't have happened. But I did have to start to learn to do shortcuts and so my ladder pieces now have wonder under their raw edge cut uh, and they don't include a lot of piece work. 
because I don't, you know, I, I, before I really felt like I needed to fit in. And as it went along, it's like, if I need to tell the story, I'm not going to be able to tell as many stories if I'm needle turning everything. So I had to come up with really quick ways to be able to accomplish the stories. And I've been, I've told, I've taught it to as many people as I possibly can so that they know the application. And so just so that everybody knows it's a grid and then there's a, then you apply the, the extra pieces, you move them around and make the composition. You get those sewn down and then you go back and you add an embellishment, a thread, that captures the light. So you then you look for the light source and that tells you how to do your shadowing. That's really it. That actually brings up one of the questions that's on here. Do you uh, draw or sketch anything out before you put this together? Uh, no, it's very organic. Uh, what I do is I go through, in the beginning, I would go through quilt books and choose patterns that fit with the topic that I was trying to uh, accomplish. And then I then pulled from my resources. My resources would be my, my sculptural pieces from my father-in-law and, and those books that I had as resources. And then I had the ballet, you know, in the musical and the lyrical and the poetry, um, all of those things. Every time I did a pattern, I would save them. So I, I don't, you can use the word recycle them. I use them over again because they're mine, I, I designed them. So, um, and I hold them very close and occasionally I'll let somebody kind of like, you know, try them out. But usually um, that's my identity there um, that uh, with my patterns. So I haven't come up with any new ones yet lately. And uh, we do have a question here. How big is your bloodline? And uh, I wish I had that in front of me. I think it's uh, uh, 54 high by, I want to say it's about 36 wide. Uh, and I don't have one of those. Oh, wait a minute. I do. Okay. So, so that I can, you know, I can give, um, you know, the book you can get. Yes. First of all, that's the other thing. Um, all of the work is online. You can go to Tina Williams Brewer uh, and see the work that's there. There are three catalogs there and they are PDFs and you can download them or you can read them on online. And um, this particular one I think is really wonderful. And I, I gave a shout out to Sam Black who is the curator of the African-American collection at the Heinz History Center for his magnificent interpretation mm -hmm. of my work. Um, because like I said, I'm a fiber artist, I'm not an academic. And you, you always need that, like Mr. Rogers says, you need the helpers. And so some people can't, you know, they can feel it, they can see it, but they don't understand it. And so when our academics are able to take the time to put it down in writing, that too, solidifies your the legacy of the work and so that piece uh your bloodline was done it was 72 by 50. there you go okay by the way that link that you were talking about is in the chat box if anybody okay. uh to your catalog of work so okay. go to the chat box if you want to download that sorry go ahead amy yes yeah, so i highly recommend the, the catalogs they're they're excellent and they're um, there's a lot of um, interpretive information and you can see a lot of her other work in, in the catalogs too. And uh, we do have a question here. Have you ever dyed your own fabric? I, oh, no, I don't have to do that. I have like the best girlfriends ever. So, <laughs> and, and so, you know, they, my, my friend Jan Myers gives me like all of her leftover shibori fabrics. And, uh, you know, I have been a beggar from day one. So, I mean, the, the first, when I first started talking about the artwork and I would say when I'm saving all of these little pieces of fabric because I just didn't want to use them all up. And she said, I'm tired of hearing you say that. And she just came over and dropped a huge bag of scraps off. And then what I do is then I share them out with the students that I teach so mm -hmm. that they have a, you know, a piece of uh, shibori fabric from this other artist. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not just about me. It's about a collective, and uh, and it was mm -hmm. the it's a collective story. 
and uh, No Man Is an Island. And the books, I would the books would never have happened if it hadn't been for like Laura Horner and Martha Wasik, who just like beat me to death to have a website. I mean, those are things that I think you have to have now. Um, but when you are a practicing artist and you are trying to do community work and maintain things, you need other people to help lift that for you. But when I mm -hmm. talk with any of the, you know, artists that are, or quilters, you know, I say document your work, even if you don't think it's like fabulous, it's a, a good record for you because then you can see the progression of your work, what you need to do or not do. I mean, it's the important thing is that that we do do, okay? Mm -hmm. Because we, whether or not we're famous or whether or not we're just doing it for our family, we all have that same thing going on in our head, a satisfaction about being able to be a creative person. So, you know, no judgment. I mean, every, there's a place for all of the, the phases of, of quilting. And uh, I really encourage everybody to pick up a little piece of fabric and start to do a little darning. And um, one of my favorite things to do now is I love to use French knots in most of my work to hold down the pieces mm -hmm. rather than my herringbone stitch. So, you know, because it's kind of meditative and it's kind of a, like a little prayer as you're wrapping that thread and pulling it through. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And our, our last question here is about uh, Pittsburgh's community of fiber artists. And I think you've uh, been telling that story throughout your, throughout your presentation. Yeah, I mean, huge. And um, my, my champion person personally right here in Pittsburgh was um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Mary Brenholtz, who also works for, with me to get me into residencies in the school. But her mother was the first generation of helpers because her mother was a fabulous artist who used untraditional materials to create artwork. And she was really the one who really pushed me to, you know, to stay fast and to, to work at it, even though people didn't understand what I was doing and it didn't look the same and it was kind of different, um, you know, that it had, it had worth. And is this the part where I say to the State Museum um, that they gave me worth? Uh, and this piece was collected in the 90s and it wasn't because um, they were trying to add to their collection to have African-Americans. It was because they saw the value in the story that was there. And um, when they collected it, then that gave me even more confidence we all need to be um, confirmed one way or the other. And it's certainly a confirmation when a museum collects your work. And, and um, I'm, I'm so very grateful for that. So thank you, State Museum. Oh, well, thank you. It is, it is very precious to us. And uh, we uh, have exhibited it quite a few times and even in my short tenure there, and we will certainly continue to do so in the future. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Tina. You're always inspiring to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. A little chatty, but you know, you have to cut me off. Well, there's, there's a lot of information to share. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you did a nice little segue into the next thing. Are you guys seeing my screen now? Yes, I do. Oh, yes. Uh, Art of the State is, is currently open for our artists out there. We are uh, accepting uh, entries until May 28th. And uh, there is, uh, you can access the link at the State Museum site that's on the bottom of the, the bottom of the slide. Okay. So thank you so much, Tina. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. Bye. This was a great presentation. I always love hearing these each week. Um, you know, we are looking forward to reopening. I want to remind you guys about that. And there's that link there at the bottom. It's also in the chat box. Um, you know, looking forward to April 30th when we can uh, actually see people in person. Um, reminding you that this presentation was recorded. So we'll be sending that out maybe later in the week because of the holiday. Um, 
But then, of course, we have lots of learn at lunch times that are coming up in the future. Next week's going to be vernal ponds and the animals and plants we need them. Um, join us again with Amy if you're interested in our art program. Her next one is actually going to be May 7th. And I'm really looking forward to this. We've talked about Violet Oakley and all of her programs that we've done throughout the last couple of years. But this one's going to be a little different. And this one, we're going to actually be talking about the conservation of some of her drawings. And we're actually going to be working with the Conservation Center. So that one's going to be a little interesting. So thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend and enjoy your holiday. Thanks, everybody.